church, how are you going? Who, who's enjoyed the Toowoomba morning? Nice and warm. <laughs> it's warm in here, which is good. Thank you, Jesus, for air conditioning. It's uh, one of those things we appreciate, isn't it? I remember growing up in, a, in churches where we had no heating and no, air, no cooling and you sweat or you freeze. And uh, I love what God does in the, the new world we live in. I don't know about you, but uh, it's good. Hey, have you ever experienced identity, identity theft? Now, in Australia, 154,000 people, 154,300, they reckon, have experienced identity theft in 2020 and 2021. Isn't that incredible? And when you lose your identity, you lose your way. You you actually can't do anything. uh, And you can't get anything. You can't go anywhere. You just, you lose your way. There was a guy in Georgia in... um, About 20 years ago, he lost his memory. He was found beat up beside a hungry jacks and and he actually lost his memory. He got amnesia and didn't know who he was. It took about 20 years before he identified who his family was. Uh, And his life was a a life of homelessness because he had no identity. In America, you've got to have your social security number. He had no social security number. In and out of homelessness, couldn't do anything. But you know what? Identity theft has been around for a long time. It's been there since the beginning, actually. Genesis 3.1. And and identity is stolen sometimes by what we listen to. And this is what the serpent, the the devil, said to Eve. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. And he spoke to the woman, Do you, I understand that that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? He was about putting doubt and and starting to steal her identity. If you know the story in Genesis with Adam and Eve, Adam was told, hey, you can eat of any tree except the tree of knowledge. He could have eaten from the tree of life, but they chose the tree of knowledge. And it's interesting what was stolen from the, the, the scriptures record that God was walking in the garden. And they were hiding. All of a sudden, their identity and who they were as as created beings of God had no idea who they were. They were lost and hiding with stuff on, on their body. They were ashamed of being naked and lost their identity. You see, I think the desire for knowledge, and it was the knowledge of the good and evil, the desire from the knowledge rather than transformation of God, stole them, seduced them. And I wonder how many times in in our world as Christians has that happened to us. The temptation of knowledge affects our relationship with God. Yet God wants to know us. And I see people across the world, you may have noticed in the Chronicle yesterday, the front page of the paper saying, Christians of, of flocking away from the church and I noticed they didn't come and talk to us because we don't see that. We see people coming to know Jesus. This year alone we've seen over 300, close to 400 people give their life to Christ. and I like that. I, I, and do you know what, what it is? It's not a knowledge of God they have. It's an encounter with God. It's a transformation that we have with God. It's, it's not something that we just gain knowledge and, and let's, let's really understand the things of God, but it's actually an encounter with the living God that changes us. My question for you this morning is, what lies are you, what lies are you allowing to steal away your God-given identity? From that transformation point where you've given your life to Christ, you've had the encounter with God. What lies are coming around you that steal your God-given identity. Because it's something I think happens to all of us. I, I, I know that where we study and, and we study the, the, the ways of the world, we see Christians fall away from God. We see it because they don't understand who they are. And oftentimes it can be a religious experience and, and that's why the census is actually showing that there's been a religious experience, not an encounter with God. And people who are nominally Christian are saying, well, no, I don't know anymore. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I actually think it's not a bad thing because we actually can identify that we need to know God. And these people who don't know God can encounter God. 
and have a transformation. You see, it's so important we know our God-given identity. It not only affects what we believe about ourselves, but it also influences us about how we live our life. If we haven't got a God identity, if we don't know that we are gods and whose we are and who we are, we, we can drift through life. We can drift from one thing to another. And there could be something just like happened to Eve in Genesis 3 where the devil comes along and gives you an offer and you go, well, I'm going to take that offer rather than live in a God-given way and have our identity stolen. You see, this morning I'd love to talk about the power of knowing your God-given identity. One of the things that's been on my heart ever, ever since I've been a pastor, which has been a long time now, is we've done a lot of new Christians courses, and new Christian courses are great because they give us a whole pile of information and, and orientate us in this world of Christianity. And we can teach you how to tithe and take your 10% and sow your 10%. And you'll see, a, you'll see God move on that. We can teach you how to read the Bible and we can teach you hermeneutics and how to study the Bible and teach you how to do context and all that's really important and really good. We can teach you lots and lots of things. But the thing that concerns me is people who don't know their identity in Christ. And I think it's actually what causes people to fall away is they can get a lot of information but actually not know who they are. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And even that one scripture in Psalms 105, fearfully and wonderfully made. When you meditate on that one scripture, it can change your whole context. And this morning I want to use a lot of scripture. So if you uh, if you got the Bible app, which is... Um, on, on, you can get on your phones. There's a whole pile of scripture in there because I've got a, a lot of scripture to go through this morning. And it's not to give you knowledge, but it's to give you the understanding of who God is in your life and how God sees you. You see, firstly, biblical Christianity is transformational. We've got to understand that. Christianity is transformational. We are transformed. It's an encounter with God. We call it being born again. If you read the book of John, John called it being born again, where we actually encounter and our life becomes new. And it's so simple to, to think about it that way, yet it's so complex. It's an encounter. It's a transformation. First comes the decision, and there'll be an opportunity for you to make a decision to follow Jesus today. And the thing I love about that is the encounter with God changes our life. I remember as a young child giving my life to Jesus. Transformational. I remember Moira's story at, at a Baptist youth camp, encountering God, crying for what would seem to be hours as a young girl because of the encounter with the living God. See, it's a, an encounter that brings a transformation that changes us. The first thing we must understand is that we're a new creation. Old things have passed away. And you know the thing that i found the devil uses most is the old things. Have you noticed that? He wanders up and says, well, look at what you did. <laughs> or look at what you've done. And who do you think you are? And, and I don't know about you, but I hear those things. Because he wants to actually negate your relationship with God and he wants to take and steal from you your identity in Christ he wants to actually steal identity theft of Christians is his aim and sadly I think he's successful at it but I think we've got to rebuild and actually come back to that every day of who we are in Christ 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. The old is gone. And it's something we have to actually understand, that our sin, our past life, the challenges that we face have gone. We are a new creation. The old has passed away. New. 
fashioned and formed by God, transformed with an encounter of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. And just think about that for a minute. How do we actually do that? Well, we actually take off our old self. What the devil has said, what our old life was like, what gets into our head, we actually take it off. Remove it. Don't believe it anymore. Which is being corrupted and by deceitful desires. And we've all got them. Maybe not Moira. But we've all got them. The lust, the flesh, the, the temptations that are out there every day. You know what it's like if you watch a Netflix movie, because that's how we watch movies today, I think. It gets in your head before you go to bed. And then all of a sudden, what do you dream about? What, what gets into your head is what was ever was on the screen. It affects our life. Yeah, we've got to put it away, put it down, to understand who we are. Be, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on your new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. To be made new in the attitude of your mind, the biggest battle we face with our identity is in our head. Isn't it? Like, Honestly. The doubts that we have, the insecurities that we have, the words that are being spoken over us as children or the words that are being spoken over us as adults, that you can't do that or, or you're no good or who do you think you are? And it's true, they get spoken over us and that's why we actually have to grab hold of them, identify them and put them off. The mind is our biggest battlefield in our identity. That's why if, if you hear all, in this place all the time, you'll hear of faith confessions. That where we confess what God said about it, that song we just sung, that is, we are a new creation. The song that we knew that God love, loves us. And, and they're so important that we actually have to speak it out and hear it. Because that's how our, our mind, that's how we actually take off these things as we, we take off the things that says we're no good and we replace it to what God says about our life. That's our faith confessions. If you haven't got faith confessions and you'd like some, my ones are up on the website. You can Google it and Highlands Faith Confessions, it'll come up. And you can start to it, but it's important that we speak it out and hear it because that's how our minds are renewed. That's what's casting off and putting on is. I love it with what 1 Peter 2.9 says, and, and this is so important for our identity. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. God chose us. Isn't that exciting to think that God chose you? Before the creation of the world, God chose you. They're not just something that happened on earth. But you were fearfully and wonderfully made, created now. Created for this time. Created when the world says Christianity is dying, you're created to be disciples of Christ to change the world. Incredibly powerful. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Hmm. As a result, result, you should show others the goodness of God. That's discipleship. What is discipleship? When you think about that, discipleship's not difficult. Discipleship is really easy. Sometimes when we have these Christian words and if you've grown up in church over the years, maybe you've lived in the world of evangelism where you had to evangelize. But actually, discipleship is walking alongside people, being, the best way I can explain it, is being a good friend. And as a good friend, if you've encountered something or you've found something that's great, what do you do? You tell your friend about it. Oh, I found this really good recipe. One pot, only got to cook it, only got to wash up one pot, it's fantastic. And you tell your friends about it, don't you? 
Or you found something that you go, oh, wow, this is really good. Buy a Toyota because this is don't work. <laughs> but you've encountered Jesus. And if you're a good friend, it's not about badgering people. It's not about trying to convert them. It's just about saying, hey, this, this is what I found. Being a good friend, walking alongside people. Ephesians 1, 5 to 8 says this, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. See, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself with the view of your last sin as you go before God? Or do you see yourself as God sees you, holy through, through Jesus. So if you've given your life to Christ and you've actually been born again, you've had that encounter, you're made new, the blood of Jesus covers and cleanses your sin. And you stand before a holy God, holy because of Christ. But your mind tells you, but look at my sin, how could, how can I be there, how can I do this? Because it messes with our identity of not knowing who we are. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. The family of God. And the best way I can explain that, and I steal this from Doug, is when Doug walks into the Cameron household, walks into to Ronald and Janie's house, his mum and dad, he doesn't ask if he goes to the fridge. He just goes to the fridge. Because he's a Cameron. When my kids come up, they don't ask if they can do stuff. It's their house as well. They live in the house. Where is kids? But sometimes we wrestle with that thought. I know the story of the rich young ruler and the two brothers and the prodigal son. He's called the prodigal son. He went out and took half his inheritance and he wasted it. When the father was there looking, and the story goes, the father was looking for him to come back. After years, he came back and said, can I be a servant in your household? They said, no, you're my son. The older brother was cranky and said, well, why? He's already taken the inheritance. Why should... And the father said, hey, hey, mate. All of what I have is yours. You could have it any time. But he had that, didn't have the understanding that it was his. But how often are we like that? God decided in advance to adopt us into his, whole, into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do and gave him great pleasure. Do you think you give God great pleasure? In our identity as children, we give God great pleasure. I don't know about you, we've got grandchildren now, which I'm very excited about. As you've been to the journey with me of church over a lot of years, I sowed really hard long to get grandchildren. Sowed by telling them, when are you going to have kid, grandkids, you know? And eventually we got, a, got one and got another one on the way, which is exciting. But I look at my grandchild and I look at my kids and go, wow, I'm so proud of them. Are they perfect? Well, the grandchild is. The kids, well, not so much. But I still look at them with the eyes of a dad who loved them. I accept them. Love them. Are they perfect? No. But I love them. It's the only way we can relate to the Father God is the, the heart of a dad, the heart of a father, our identity in him, we're in his family. My son, Chris, who'd probably be here in between the services, along with my grandchild, I hope. But he's a big man now. But I remember when he was a little kid, he was only a little kid. And I tell this story because it's the way I explain the love of God. He's probably about two years old. And we're in a little church, in a school hall. The music was okay. It wasn't, actually. It was ordinary. The presence of God was in that place. This little kid wandered up, little Chris, and he put his hands up to me and 
to pick him up and I picked him up and I grabbed him and as he hugged me, he said, Daddy, I love you. Tears in my eyes. But I heard God say as clear as a bell straight at that moment, that's how I am with you. He loves you. Sometimes we miss that. Sometimes in our journey of life and our, we get into the busyness of life and get into Christianity can be some, become something we do on a Sunday or when we read our Bible in the morning or in the evening or whatever it is, but we miss that we're actually giving God pleasure as a parent by how we actually love him if we recognize we're his. See, learning your true identity does two things. It gives you the courage to let go of the past. It gives you the courage to walk into the future. When you understand your identity in God, that who you are, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are born again, that you are a new creation, the old things have passed away, you can actually let the past go because that's what so many people struggle with is their past. It always seems to be behind them and they can't let it go. But that gives us the promise that we let it go, but it gives us the courage to walk into the future, to step out to where God's calling us to go. I can tell you story after story in our life, but I love watching what God does with people as they step into the faith journey and see where God takes them. Do you trust God? It gives you that ability to step into your future, the courage I think about Moses and when you think about and read the story of Moses and you read it through Exodus, there was Moses and he was in the Pharaoh's household as an adopted child. He was taken into that whole household and given it all. He wasn't born into the household, he was adopted into it. It was the plan of God in his life, but then he, he actually went out in the wilderness because he killed a guy and got fearful and went, went into the wilderness and then God called him and brought him back to lead the people out of Egypt. He had to let go of his past to actually take those people in Egypt into their future. He actually had to let go of who he was as Moses to step into his future. And Egypt speaks of and we think if you study the scriptures, Egypt speaks of our old life. <coughs> Egypt speaks of the slavery and bondage. That's what it speaks of. So if you study the scripture and look at what Egypt represents, it actually represents bondage and slavery. And the question that I have for you is what things in your old life, what bondage is holding you back that you need to step away from? See, knowing your true identity allows you to walk out of there. What is your Egypt? What is it? We've all got them. But are we able to walk free? My Egypt can be my business life. I remember when God did it to me, and he did do a number on me. My only dream that I had left in business in Australia, I was an Australian CEO of, an Australian, of a New Zealand company actually in Australia. And the, day be, the week before I was offered a role that I desired, I made a commitment to God to say, I'll go into the ministry. The week after, the, manage, the managing director, the owner of the company, come to me and said, Ken, we want you to be the international marketing manager but we also want you to go to America and set up the business in America. And that's my only desire I had left in business. Because I thought I've, we've been successful in a small market. Imagine what we could do in a big market. But you've got to leave the past behind. The funny thing was that God said to us in that time, he said, do you make a decision this was before we was asked that question. If you make a decision, I'll bless you in the ministry or I'll bless you in business. That's what he said to us. When we left Bible college, we went back to pastor a little church in Sydney and 
We were in Bible College in Brisbane and went back and I still had all my contacts in the security industry that I worked for. And a fellow come to me and said, Ken, you can earn $1,000 an installation. It'll take you two hours to do it. Two hours and I could earn $1,000 and God said, don't do it. Because he knew what I was like. I had to leave the past behind to go into the future. How about you? What's your Egypt? What holds you back? Knowing your identity gives you the courage to walk into your new destiny. Paul put it this way to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 15, uh, 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new cre- creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. Can I encourage you to set your sights on heaven and the promises of God rather than the influence around you? Your friends, family, social media today can affect your destiny and what God has for you. Hebrews 12, 2 says it this way, keep your eyes on Jesus who began and finished the race we're in. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, put it this way, Put it this way, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ thinks, sits. Thinks about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. There's so much in these scriptures around our identity. When God has given you an, a new identity, you can focus on the long term. Not people's opinions of you, not priorities they have for you, but on the realities of heaven. The race God has given you to run. So if you know your identity, who you are in Christ, if you've actually had that encounter, we need to keep walking towards our future and the destiny of God. Romans 4.17 says this way, God calls those things that are not as though they are. In the natural world, God is calling us may not exist, but in his eyes it does. So we need to talk to ourselves the same way as God sees it. The future God has for you. So I've got these scriptures. Anyone go to the anyone go to the doctor and the doctor says, "Take this medicine and you'll get better." Usually, when I go, he says, "Take Panadol and go to bed." Which I think, well, why do I bother going? <laughs> but can I encourage you this week as we go into this series to take these scriptures? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we are new creatures. Take it once a day. Understand that you are a new, crea- a new creature. That we are the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That we are the righteousness of God. That we have been healed if you're sick, if you're struggling. 1 Peter 2, 24. Take that, that promise and declare it over your life. That we've been made rich. And see, people struggle with money and they struggle with money in their Christian identity because they think we've over doctrine over years means we must be poor. But God, everywhere through Scripture, calls us to be blessed. Why? So we can be a blessing to others. It's not just to be wealthy, it's to be a blessing. To be the blessing. Understand that you have been called to be rich, that you are accepted, you're not rejected by God. Even if you've gone through and done something horrific this week, you're still accepted by God. He might not approve of what you've done, but He accepts you. Isn't that exciting? Even to think about that one thought, He doesn't approve of what we do. As a dad, sometimes I look at what my kids do, I don't approve of what they do, but I accept them that you're accepted by God, that we are free from sin. You might not feel free, but you are free. You're free. You can walk through. If you declare over your life, I am the righteousness of God, you watch sin fall away from you. See, God turns nobodies into somebodies. Patterns can be be removed. Romans 12, 1, the renewing of your mind. And curses can be reversed. But it's up to us to walk out of of Egypt, take hold of our identity, take back what was stolen 
and walk into our future. Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room. Oh God, I look at it. And Father, we can learn lots of things. We can have lots of knowledge. We can know lots of scripture. But God, to know who we are, to know our identity, we can walk boldly in the throne room of God, scripture says, just like we can walk into our home We can walk boldly into home. Heaven is our home. We can open the promises you have for us. Take hold of them, walk in them. So Father, I ask you to help each and every one of us with our identity. It is a a decision and a transformation that takes place. And Father, I know that we have to be transformed day after day after day. The scripture is being sanctified, being changed, being cleaned, being transformed. That it's a lifetime, lifelong journey, Father. But Father, let us understand that our identity in you, whose we are and who we are. So Father, I pray for everyone in this room right now to have this encounter with you. Hey, just while every eye is closed and every head's bowed, I promised that I'd give you the opportunity to actually be born again, to have the opportunity to know God, not just know of Him too. So it's not just a religious experience, but it's something that changes your life, the transformation of God, the decision that leads to transformation. And maybe in this room today, there's someone who, just, you've never been transformed. You've never had the encounter. It's, maybe it's been a religious experience for you. Maybe, maybe you've built up in church and it's just something you do. But there is a thing that happens when you actually encounter God, when He comes into your life and changes you. I want to give you that opportunity. The way we do that here, and we do it every service because it's so vitally important to begin that journey with God that you invite him into your heart. So right across this room right now, if that's you and you've never done that and you'd like to, would you raise your hand so I can see it, so I can pray with you. Just so I look across this room. Father, thank you for every person in this room. They make decisions to know you. Last time I'm asking this morning, it's not about knowing about God, it's about knowing God. Well, Father, I pray for everyone here. If they know you, Lord, continue to woo them. Secure them in you, their identity in you. They don't know you, Lord. I ask you to continue to woo them till they come into that relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you made that decision this morning,